Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Misumiano Versace of a company called Narawa, N-E-U-R-A-L-A. Website is N-E-U-R-A-L-A.com. Dax, how are you doing? Good, good. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah thanks for coming. So tell me about uh, Narawa. What does the company do? What's the premise? Well, the premise is really easy. It was funded by three uh, artificial intelligence students. We were, um, uh, Anatoly, Heather, and myself back at Boston University. Uh, in, around 2006, uh, we uh, filed some patents on using graphic processing units for uh, artificial intelligence. That, that was fairly early on. Uh, we thought that one major bottleneck for the mass deployment of AI was uh, increased compute power. And so at that point, we figure out a way, in, uh, so to say, to hack a GPU and make it uh, essentially a brain processor. And, uh, you know, the, as, as you can tell, the, uh, that early effort uh, has today become now stream with the uh, availability of, uh, mass availability of uh, GPUs and other specialized processors in AI. Uh, since that time, we have developed some uh, fundamental technology that enables uh, machine to learn in real time, even on small compute power, and we are today porting this technology into various uh, smart devices application, uh, ranging from uh, consumer applications, from you know, smart uh, smartphone that are really smart uh, that, that are able to execute uh, complex AI on the edge, uh, to um, enterprise solutions, for instance, for a drone uh, inspection to be able to uh, to, to enable complex uh, um, inspections of uh, structures uh, by putting this intelligence on, on the edge and or on the cloud, depending on the use case. So you said you were one of the early people who used GPUs to speed up calculations, but um, you know, if you're going to run AI off a smartphone or off other computers, uh, is it still using the GPU portion of the device to run, or is it just using the CPU portion, and, and how does it work today? Is it just, do we have enough computing power in the devices that they can run these AI systems? Yeah, so let me let me step back for a second. So back in 2005, um, uh, you, you only had uh, limited options, right? So you could you can use a CPU, which was uh, uh, pl- already plateauing in terms of the uh, total speed of the processor. So right, so you you have seen the process on processing industry that uh, has plateaued in terms of the, the, um, the overall speed of the processor and the, the solution is to, to spread out calculation across multiple processors, right? So the, the, uh, is, you, you don't have an infinite amount of speed in one processor, but you have dual core, quad core, eight core, and so forth. So brains really need many, many, many cores. They're really characterized by billions of neurons, each of one is really slow. And so the closest thing we could find in the industry that wouldn't destroy your wallet was a gaming uh, chipset, which was the GPU, originally designed to render pixels on the screen. Uh, today, uh, that architecture is, uh, uh, I think it has more application in AI than it has in gaming. Uh, and the basic intuition is still the same. You have a pixel, as opposed to use it as a pixel, you use it as a neuron. Uh, and so you have uh, many, many neurons, as many pixels you have on the screen, and those can be uh, used to accelerate uh, computation. So, uh, as you know, smartphones today have a lot of graphical capabilities. So, yes, you can use the, the GPU on the smartphone to, to, render, uh, to render a neural network rather than, uh, than, than an image. Uh, so, yes, we can use the GPU on cell phones, but what you're seeing in the industry today is the appearance of a different kind of processor uh, as opposed to the the CPU, uh, the classical, you know, von Neumann, uh, 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 tens tens of years old uh, uh, processor, and the GPU, you also have an NPU, where the N stands for Neural Processing Unit. So you're seeing the introduction of a third processor, which is dedicated to, to AI applications, which is slightly different than a GPU. It's more, has less things that have to do with graphic and more things that have to do with neural processing. And so today we, we are shipping 
on all three processors, uh, even on the smartphone, right? Even the CPU uh, has become fast enough to execute some small neural networks, but the, for the biggest one, you have the choice of a GPU or an MPU. Well, I know from the uh, you know, the Bitcoin and uh, blockchain world, they have what's called ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits. It sounds like that's the way chipsets are heading for AI. The NPUs sound like ASICs in a way. They're, they're very, very specific towards uh, AI applications. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, and this is actually a, you know, a, a story that is fairly old, right? So if we... If we Everybody talks about AI today, like uh, if they woke up from a, a big, a big, a big sound sleep. Uh, you know, neural processor have been around for many, many years, and there's always been attempt to build ASIC uh, and FPGAs and uh, other more, um, uh, I would say, um, you know, uh, fancy architectures that uh, are um, speeding up calculation of neural networks. So ASICs is obviously a um, one of the solutions, but you know, for instance, I was involved in 2008 on a large DARPA initiative called DARPA Synapse that uh, kind of laid the foundation of many of the solutions that you're seeing today in the market. Um, and that was an attempt to design ASIC um, chipset around the, the idea of uh, neural processing with kind of new form of memory and so forth. So I think we are seeing the beginning uh, of a big trend, and there have been many false starts in the past. But today, there is enough money, attention, data, and all the, all the various ingredients to make this, um, the, the development of hardware specific for neural network um, sort of a more, a more of a compelling business opportunity rather than just a, a fun experiment. Yeah, I've noticed over the past two years that all of a sudden AI has had a big resurgence. And uh, I guess part of the big reason is computing power has finally gotten good enough. Um, do you know companies that are developing an ASIC chipset for, uh, for neural networks or for AI, or are you guys doing it, or are you advising on it, or you know, who do you know out in the landscape that's working on it right now? Yeah, so the, the, um, there are tons of startups. I, I will just cite a few major players. Uh, I mean, if you look at in, Intel, right? Uh, Intel has bought two companies in the past uh, uh, year and a half, I think, um, and uh, uh, you know, in their effort to compete against NVIDIA, which is a dominating force in the in server, but also a very strong force in the edge computing with their uh, mobile chipset called um, you know, the, the Tegra uh, or TX1 and TX2 and, and so forth. Um, the, in, Intel is trying to uh, fight with, uh, with, uh, uh, with NVIDIA by buying a couple of companies. One was um, uh, Movideos, for instance, uh, which was bought uh, uh, about a year ago. Uh, trying to compete with edge computing uh, solutions and providing co-processing, uh, you know, very lightweight and fast uh, uh, and fast co-processing that can be embedded in, in ed compute edges. Uh, the other one was Nirvana, which was the equivalent solution for server, right? And so these are essentially special purpose processors, uh, but Intel is not alone. Um, Qualcomm is doing the same. Um, um, Samsung is introducing its own processors, uh, and they're sometimes buying startups to do that. Uh, Huawei, which is another big player in, uh, in China, is developing their own, their own processors called Cambricorn, or the, the name of the company is called Cambricorn, which is owned by Huawei, where they're essentially saying AI is so big, uh, why should we depend on, on NVIDIA or, or, or Intel? They're building their own processors. So you're seeing uh, not only a sea of startups building their own uh, processing uh, Solutions and trying to 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 attack big players, but the big players themselves, you know, silings and and so forth, they're building their own neuromorphic processor. So on top of that, it has to be software ecosystem that that makes this processor easy to use. So uh, it, I would say it's a gold rush right now, which will be followed by you know consolidation with uh, center around a few winners. So what do you think the AI industry is going to look like in the next you know three to five years? Once these processors come online, once software comes online, what do you think is going to happen? Will it be a big leap forward again from where it's now? Yeah, I think uh, what we're going to see is um, um, today um, domination of uh, large companies. Uh, essentially, NVIDIA is dominating the, the AI chipset market. We are going to see in you know two to three years a more fragmented ecosystem where there will be winners that are very specialized in particular use cases. So we're going to have 
very strong companies that deliver solutions for IoT devices, smartphones, uh, smart cameras, uh, cell phones, and, uh, and then go up the food chain until you get to large servers. Each one of these have a very unique uh, compute uh, constraints, and so, you know, power constraints and so forth. And so you're, you're going to see, you know, a more verticalized and specialized uh, uh, set, of, uh, set of hardware solution with their, with their uh, specific software, uh, you know, uh, stack. Obviously, what, there has to be an effort uh, in uh, uniformizing the, you know, the, the programming environment. You, you don't want programmers to have to learn 20 different frameworks, so there would be probably a few winners around TensorFlow and Cafe, maybe, uh, that would be the, you know, the dominant uh, framework, and then those will have backends to plug into all these different hardware. So I think that's the next stage. Yeah, so when people say that, you know, all devices are going to get smart, now I finally understand the path on how that's going to happen. I guess it's going to be with these uh, these off-the-shelf solutions, you know, both in terms of the chips and in terms of the software, so they can be put into all kinds of devices and make yeah, them I mean, smart. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that, that's right. But look, I think there is a, a, an additional granularity here to, to be able to understand. So, um, you know, I've been in AI for 20 to 25 years at this point. I'm starting to have AI gray hair. Um, and so uh, let's, let's for a second pause and, uh, and evaluate this phrase, which is the models that we are seeing today have been developed in the 90s, right? So the, the um, much of the mathematics and the the, the, the modus operandi of how you train and deploy a neural network is actually pretty old. I was I call this the steam engine era of AI, right? Um, and the the, the, sure. the real yeah yeah that's 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 true. I mean the what has changed is that uh, that neural networks run much much faster because processors are much faster, but the procedure that is used to build uh, one of these uh, AI systems is, is steam engine based um, and. Uh, I, one of the things that why neural exists, uh, why we have a spot in the world uh, of AI, I believe our mission is to, to bring AI industry to the next step. And the, the way we are doing this is to, providing, to provide a different way to train this neural network, which resembles a little bit more like humans, rather than the way these things have been trained in the, you know, since the 90s, which, which has been cumbersome and sort of... A, you know, you start with a large data set, you train on a server, and then you deploy, and, and the system is uh, doesn't cannot improve anymore after it has been put on a device. So um, I, I think we in Neurala, we are changing this by providing the ability to learn additional information after you are deployed. But I think one big change in AI that I foresee in the, you know, again, in that time frame, or since today, if, if we are successful commercially, is to begin to see these devices that are able to learn continuously after deployment and so they get smarter and a little bit uh, more intelligent and useful continuously you know without being just dead and have the intelligence that they had out of the factory so what yeah i don't know if you can explain it but what's the difference in the models that you're, you're working with versus the ones that have been around for you know 20 or 30 years what's new about them yeah, so the, the basic process is that we are emulating uh, aspect of um, a process of, of the cerebral cortex in, in software, right? So we, as I was mentioning, the past uh, um, you know, background of the founders is, you know, developing of cortical models, you know, once we were doing our PhD at Boston University. And so we came up with um, a different methodology based on uh, uh, human neurophysiology that uh, characterizes the way that humans instantaneously learn information on the fly, right? So, for instance, I tell you, my name is Max Versace, I come from Venice, and, uh, you know, I like uh, caprese salad, right? And um, it, to, it took you, you know, essentially a fraction of a, section, a second to learn this information. So, perhaps, you know, you will not, you and the listener will not remember all of them in perpetuity that, uh, you know, I am from Venice and I like caprese, but, you know, some of you will. And that's uh, uh, based on the ability to imprint information in, in cortical neurons uh, that is completely different than, than the technology that is deployed today uh, that makes these devices be able to learn but then become stiff and rigid after they are deployed. And so the, this is the sort of technology that um, you can envision uh, creating r truly smart devices, right? Imagine a camera that uh, gets better over time in recognizing you or your dog or um, you know, the people you care for or, um, you know, 
uh, a self-driving car that continuously improves its performance day after day. So this is, I think, the true leap of AI that we have to expect. Uh, you know, rather rather than uh, doing the same thing twice as fast, I think we we are poised to see a qualitative change. Well, what how does the brain uh, compute information versus you know neural networks? Like, what are the any fundamental differences you can talk about, or you know, mechanical differences? Yeah. Um, well, so first of all, um, let me give you an, uh, an analogy, right? So the let's go out of neural network for a second and th think about the physics, right? Um, so today there are scientists that simulate Jupiter atmosphere on a computer, right? And uh, you might ask, what's the difference between a simulation of Jupiter on a computer and Jupiter? Well, there is a, there is a lot. There is a lot uh, to, to be said about the differences. So. In a sense, what we have uh, today is a, a mockery, or um, a, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a mockery because that's degrading. Let's say a, a very very high level simplification of what a, a brain does on a computer, and the simplification is both qualitative and quantitative, right? So, for example, when I was um, doing my PhD thesis, and I thought I was going to study the brain really really in detail. I had each single neuron in the brain in my simulation defined by, you know, a million differential equations. Such, such was the amount of details to, to get to, to, to define a single neuron, and we have 100 billion of them, so that you can claim that the neuron is fairly similar uh, to, to, a, to a biological neuron. So I think that our ability to really characterize all the properties of, uh, of what neurons do in software to say we finally have a copy of the brain with all its, all these bells and whistles is hundreds of years away in terms of uh, compute power and uh, understanding. But that doesn't change the fact that we can know enough to be dangerous. So even if I can describe a neuron at, with one single equation, it can still do, say, you know, 20% of, uh, of what a biological neuron does. Um, and that's enough to build application where you can say, okay, I can substitute a human brain for a machine brain, even though it's performing at very limited functionality, it just does one thing, um, I can say, relieve a human to do a task that is dull, dangerous, or, or just not worth of a, of a human to do. And so in a sense, today, we, we know very little, but that little is enough to do something useful. Well, can you tell me about some of the specific applications you're working on? What what have you been able to achieve, and what do the applications do? Absolutely. So I'll give you a couple. So we are uh, embedded today. Uh, I cannot name the company, but we're in a top three smartphone manufacturer, so a, a, a global brand that sells millions of phones worldwide. And we're embedded into their uh, uh, camera application to make pictures um, stunning and beautiful, sort of like if you had an AI, a sort of, uh, sorry, uh, a human expert uh, taking picture for you, but we have substituted that with a, um, an AI expert that uh, understands the scene and makes that picture compelling and beautiful for, for the user. So that's an example in which AI is not stealing jobs or is not uh, killing people or, you know, it's doing something that is very, very, very useful for, for the, the consumer who buys a phone and wants a very beautiful picture and doesn't want you know, to pay for a photographer to make them pretty. Um, so that's one application uh, where we have uh, our AI embedded in, in millions of phones. Um, the second application that uh, I will mention is uh, drone inspections. Right? So the, the idea of uh, um, inspecting an, a structure that has, uh, uh, you know, is hard to reach maybe, or uh, you know, cannot be inspected by human with uh, without danger or, or high cost. And so a drone can be flown, and uh, the images from the drone are captured and uh, analyzed by AI uh, to make that task uh, uh, easier for the for the human, or you know, or substitute uh, a human that otherwise will have to stop doing what it does and uh, look at gigabytes of pictures. So very different application the, with a common thread of making something. Uh, useful or, or uh, you know, relieving the human from a task that nobody wants to do or or it's expensive to do. Yeah, I guess I imagine a, a drone examining a bridge, you know, that's that's way up high, you know, looking underneath the bridge, and you'd normally have to have a person, you know, roped in and, and inspecting it physically, and it would take a while, and it's dangerous, so it makes sense. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole deal of inspection, uh, you know, telecommunication tower, power distribution line and uh, bridges, uh, the fact that the human needs to do it uh, limits the frequency of the inspection, therefore the, the potential danger uh, or, you know, if you don't inspect something as, as, as frequently as you do because of cost or, or risks, that's that's a danger. And if you send a human, it's also a danger. So it's, it's kind of a no-brainer application for AI, I would say. So what kind of benefits are you getting from your, your learning models? I mean, you said historically you'd have to feed in a ton of data yeah. and, you know, the system would train on the data and then it, it, it would be pretty good at working with that data, but new data sets maybe that were different, it would probably have a hard time with. Yeah. So how are so, your, your systems different? What, what makes them better? Okay, so let me dispel a myth uh, of AI for, for all of your listeners, and you, you guys should listen carefully. The chance of your AI application to be trained uh, you know, out of the box and work is zero, right? So the, the, there is no chance that uh, your AI would be perfect. There is no chance that uh, a drone that needs to inspect the structure and classify rust, for instance, is going to be able to work off the shelf. Um, it's like the same, the same way in which uh, you, know, you expect a human to be trained on a task and never make a mistake. That doesn't happen, right? So you, you go to school, you, run, you learn a skill, and then you go to work, and you make mistakes. And then you, you refine over time, and you still make mistakes, but you, you make less. So the, the, the promise of our technology, which is already, is already scheduled to be shipped uh, in, in, the, in the fall in some consumer devices, is to make this continuously iterative and continuously learning because we recognize that the, the chance of your AI working off the shelf is what it is, which is zero. So you need to, well, it's not zero, but you know, it, it's going to make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are annoying, even if it has 10% mistakes you want your AI to get to 95, 99%. And uh, I think that's the only way to do it is to enable learning directly on the device so that it gets better over time. So what does that curve look like and how close does it approach, um, you know, perfection? How long does it take? You know, let's say for your example of, uh, it sounds like it uses computer vision, you know, yeah. to spot problems on structures. So what's, what's that one look like, for instance? Well, so those are really specific problems and they depend, uh, you know, if you have enough data. But we, usually we do tests of our technology on data sets that are well recognized. So, for instance, a, a network that recognizes stuff on a data set, like a large scale data set, might get to, you know, say 85% uh, correct, right? So that's a, a typical result that you see in the literature. In order to get there, we have to train the system for a week and then the, the AI doesn't improve after that. So with our technology, we get to 85% instantaneously, like in, in a few seconds. You know, we, we train in a few seconds what takes you know, about uh, uh, a few hours to train, but then it can continuously improve. Right? So we, we never plateau as, uh, as other solutions do. So it looks pretty promising, and the first uh, application that we are shipping is a concern with digital photography, where the concept is that the more pictures you take, your the more your AI is getting smarter at recognizing, you know, what you're taking pictures of and making those pictures more, uh, more, more, you know, likable. Do your systems continuously get better because of the personalization of the data it's looking at, meaning your data, or is it because you're using a different type of algorithm to, you know, learn on the data? The second, right? So we, we are using a different type of algorithm, um, and uh, uh, whereas in prior or in, in conventional AI application, the data comes in, it's processed, but it doesn't change that the brain, underlying brain. In our system, it continuously tweaks and changes it. And so, uh, in one case, you can consider the AI, you know, has reached its plateau, right? It doesn't doesn't move. In the other case, it changes a little bit its performance. Well, what can you say about how your algorithm is different versus, uh, you know, what's commonly out there? I know you can't say everything, obviously, it's your proprietary stuff, but, you know, any, anything you can say about it? Well, the first thing I'd say is that it took us uh, three PhDs, uh, and each of which is four years, to actually understand, uh, understand how, first of all, why is that different, and second, to come up with alternatives. So it, it uses a different form of learning um, that uh, has been, uh, actually, it's, it's actually a fairly old concept. And uh, 
um, the, the the basic principle is not that different from the the idea that uh, a, a very known psychologist, Russian psychologist, introduced. Uh, his name is Jan Pavlov, and the idea that when you associate stimuli, say uh, I ring a bell and I present food, um, the the dog instantaneously associates and gets and gets the um, uh, excited just by the ability to just just by the presentation of a bell that evokes the idea of food. So our brain is continuously uh, capturing these coincidences and associating events in the environment it, it, to, to, without us knowing it or, or noticing or paying any attention, right? So you're continuously associating things that happen to you and you're learning those links uh, uh, seamlessly. And, uh, you know, maybe you go to sleep and then you wake up the day after and everything becomes clear in your mind that, you know, what caused that reaction was what you said. But the, the reason why you remember the day after is that those links are, are created w while you're awake and uh, they get reorganized during sleep. So our process does fair, something fairly similar. As the neural network fires and the, understands the image, links are created. They are reorganized, you know, in, in sort of a, in a sleep fashion uh, that we impl have implemented in our own way. Uh, but they kind of uh, modify, uh, continuously modify your understanding of the world. And for more information, please join a PhD program. <laughs> that's, that's good. That, that gives a little bit of uh, a little bit of color to it. Very interesting. Hmm. Um, where do you see? I guess you know we'll we'll finish up with just a couple of generic questions. So, do you feel like the industry is on a tipping point, or we just have a long way to go? It's just like a long marathon. We just got to keep plotting. Or do you see any breakthroughs coming in the next few years, where AI is really going to show some impressive uh, results? No, I think uh, the the point of non return has been reached. Right, so the, there is not going to be um, a, a scenario where uh, people would, will uh, be disappointed by by AI and uh, we'll go back to something else that is not AI. I think AI is here to stay, and uh, dif that, that's been different from what I've seen in my career. Uh, you know, there have been other false starts, but in this case, I can tell you that the the, the threshold has been has been passed. So now it's the uh, the race is to provide the best uh, possible solution for AI, and uh, what we have been noticing um, for for um, you know in all this confusion and gold rush and the you know me tours that come to the field and say yeah I, I know AI listen to me listen to me I think there is still uh, some uh, fundamental challenges uh, in in AI and we have talked about processors and processors are one challenge right um, and the, uh, the second one is algorithms. Right, so the the idea of uh, continuous learning, we have talked about this too. The third challenge is the data, right? And uh, for for a second, let's let's pause and remember that there is no AI without data, right? So you need data, uh, you need you need to amass knowledge uh, to train a neural network. And uh, uh, at this point, I don't think that anybody has uh, provided the right tool for AI developers to de to gather and uh, systematize and classify all this data to provide the first burst of training to a, an AI system and then, you know, is deployed in the field and can either be stable, as we discussed, or can learn continuously. So what we have done in Neurala is actually we have decided to solve the first problem first, which is sort of the foundation of all of our customers that come to us. And you might think, oh, AI has moved so fast and so far, but the problems that our customers have are they come to us and they say, well, Yay, I want your, your AI model, but I don't have any data. Right? So we have decided after we listened to the 100th customer to provide some tools to organize, tag, and create that initial data set that is compulsive for, for the deployment of any AI application. So we are actually launching this in a beta um, this month, and uh, I think there is a, uh, a podcast, um, a webinar tomorrow. Uh, with our team explaining why do you need data. So in a sense, I would like to to remind people, yes, AI is uh, moving like a uh, like a, an airplane, but in, it's an airplane that is being built as you fly. It's, it, there is a lot, a lot of steam engine, remember the, the first analogy. There is a lot of uh, 1800 in, into, into, into the industry that needs to be addressed and modernized and solved. And uh, I think we, we want to start from the bottom, from the, the very beginning, which is the data. Uh, sort of the food that the AI consumes.
Yeah, no, that makes sense. If you don't have the data, if you don't have enough data, not the right data, I mean, the whole thing is just garbage in, garbage out, I'm sure. So, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that's definitely um, the case. I just have one last question, that is a tough one. You know, I've heard uh, with neural networks and a lot of these AI systems that how it works is a black box. Can you talk about why that is and what is it that people are not able to see when an AI system is running to, to have them say, oh, it's a black box? Yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, reply to you with a tough question. I, I don't I don't know much of you and if you're married or not. But if if I have to ask you why did you get married, you will uh, you will uh, you, you see where I'm going, right? I I usually ask back the, this question. I say why did you get married, right? And uh, it's funny how we think of humans as uh, driven by this deterministic flowchart like uh, impeccable reasoning that uh, makes everything transparent and clear, right? Um, my last name is Versace. Versace is about fashion and clothes. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is that piece of clothing nicer than the other one? Right? Give me the flowchart. So I, I'm going to dispel another myth that humans are rational. Right? Uh, we do have one thing that machines don't yet, but I don't see any reason why they shouldn't have it, which is the ability to verbalize what we think is the reasoning that, that carried for, for the, from those premises to those conclusions. Um, that's what we have differently. Can that be done by a neural network? Totally, absolutely. You know, give enough time, there is a field called explainable AI that is providing, um, you know, additional intuition of why is that the case. But humans are black boxes. So is a crab, and the bird, and the cow. But they, they are all intelligent animals, including humans, perhaps. So that means when you look at an AI system, uh, it can get you the result, but we just don't know exactly how it got to that result. Well, I would, I would uh, challenge this. Um, so first of all, you, you don't know how a human got to the result either. You have uh, mm. a verbal account of what the human thinks uh, that he, you know, I, I, I can, I can uh, listen to some of the president of the United States accounts of how he reached various decisions, but you know, I'm not sure it's, a, it's much better than a black box at this point. Um, right. but, so the, 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 the truth of the matter is that uh, whereas you can never know, or at least with our current technology, you can never know how a person reached a, a decision other than listening to his or her account, unless you are the CAA or some sort of a truth serum, um, the, the, the opposite is not true for AI. So AI, you have total visibility of what each neuron is thinking and what in what each constellation of neuron is thinking. So you can actually trace uh, in a fairly deterministic way what happens in the decision process of the network. So I think at the end of the day, give it a couple of years maybe, you will be able to understand how a neural network works much better than how a human takes a decision. It's a simpler system to analyze and you have total control. Uh, you know, you cannot open the people's skull to look what's inside, but you can do that with AI. So I, I am actually, uh, you know, I stand on the other side of the story, which is you, are, you, you should know much better about AI than, than about humans. Okay, it makes sense. It's great. That's a good explanation. Well, very good. So, um, you know, we're out of time, but what are some resources for listeners? You said you're going to have a webinar uh, perhaps tomorrow. Uh, you know, how do they get in touch if they want a system developed for them, if they're enterprise, or if they want to learn more? What are a few resources for people? Yeah, I mean, the, our website, uh, Twitter uh, account, uh, LinkedIn account, uh, all the social media has plenty of information. If they want to sign up, sign up for the webinar, it's tomorrow. Uh, and uh, it's actually Wednesday, sorry. And uh, the, um, the information is on our website. There is a big banner. And, uh, you know, everybody who builds AI should know how to, how to do the, the, bread, the, the bread and butter, you know, the, the data. You know, they, they, they should know that, right? So it's, uh, it's something that uh, everybody who is... Uh, interested or, or planning to practice AI should be fluent before even thinking about something else. Okay, very good. Well, Max, thanks for coming on. And uh, I really like your explanations. They're easy to understand. And it's a great perspective on uh, how AI works. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. Hold on one second. You've been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, 
virtual reality, and more.